Okay, so let's uh, let's begin. Um, as first of all, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for coming. I, I, we almost canceled this um, with everything that's going on, and especially because, as many of you know, ECAR just held a kind of community gathering, just processing. And uh, we were talking this morning, maybe we should just cancel the class because um, we want to do it at that time. And also just being on screens, like who wants to be on the screen for two hours? Uh, first of all, not all of you were probably in the last session, so that <laughs> that doesn't apply to everybody. But I but I think um, we decided to keep the class on um, because I was already planning to um, to study some study um, some poetry tonight that I think is relevant to our current situation, um, and also because um, because I think direct processing is, um, is, is important, but that this is a different kind of way of, of processing. This is a different sort of modality. Um, so, so having said that, I wanna just start with a couple of caveats um, about what we're gonna do and, and, and mostly about the fact that I called this poetry for, for, for times of political turmoil. Um, I, I wanna just say that one of the things that I have learned um, now that I work as a rabbi is that when you work as a rabbi, people uh, turn to you and expect you to have um, wisdom and, and inspiration. And um, so caveat number one is that I don't have any wisdom. I don't, um, I don't feel like I feel as lost as, as, as anyone in the midst of all of this. And, uh, and I certainly don't have anything, any advice or, you know, particularly profound wisdom. Um, but I, but I don't, um, I, I want to say in the same breath, I, I, I also don't turn to the Torah for wisdom, at least not in that way. I don't turn to the Torah, to our tradition for direct advice. Right? Like, oh, we'll study this, this psalm tonight and now we'll know how to approach the situation we're in. This will, this will be a perfect template for us. If that happens, great. But I study Torah um, as a way of... Um, as a way of reflecting on something in my world, related to, to my world, but, but not in my world. And that feels actually really important to me to have a space where I can think about something without having to think directly about what I'm dealing with in my life, but something that's sort of, it's in that general area. And somehow I find that, that what happens for me in studying Torah a lot is that I can sort of leave the, the direct confrontation with the issues in my own life and, and exist in, in, a, in a little bit of a middle space where I'm thinking about them, but not thinking uh, directly about them. And then when I come back, I find without having extracted a particular lesson, I do sometimes, I'm surprised by the way certain notions have lingered in my mind. Um, and that does help. And I, and I, I, I think poetry can, can, can work like that as well. Um, that it isn't something that we, oh, let's read the poem that will help us figure out what to do or will, that will carry the wisdom that we need, but rather a way of, of thinking differently and thinking um, maybe a little out of context and then, and then, and then perhaps you know, bring, coming back into context with something, something more. Um, and uh, and, I, and I, I guess I also want to say that I don't necessarily, on that note, um, turn to poetry for inspiration either, at least not in the, not necessarily in the feel good sense, right? Like, I don't think that the point of, of any poetry um, is necessarily, and certainly not the piece we're going to look at tonight, is necessarily to like be inspired and then, and then feel great about things. Um, in fact, I, I think often the, um, the job of poetry is to provoke and, and maybe even to sometimes to agitate. And I say that because you may be provoked <laughs> or agitated. Tonight, um, we're going to look at a psalm that I think is really, um, it is in that kind of but you can't hear him relevant but not directly him. relevant space. That is um, a psalm that touches on some of the themes that um, we are currently processing in our world and in our country, which is in this um, political conflict and upheaval. Um, um, I was, you know, last time that we, um, that we, we got into, we started this, um, we looked at a piece from Genesis, a little piece of, po a verse from Genesis, and, you know, there's a way to do this, 
like uh, systematically to work through, let's now see if there's anything else in Gen Genesis and then move to Exodus or move by category or something like that. But I, I felt that in our second meeting, we have to go right to the book of Psalms because it's when we talk biblical poetry, we're talking Psalms maybe above all, like Psalms is the book of poetry, the book of 150 poems. And, um, and so I wanted to get right into that. And I was gonna start with Psalm one, which is a fascinating uh, uh, poem in itself. But, I, um, but with everything that's going on, I did start to think like, uh, is there something that we can learn that might be poetry for the moment? And in fact, um, Psalm two is, is, the, is, is the one I picked, which is to say, and this is just the first thing that I wanna say um, about, about our, our material tonight, but also just about the book of Psalms, which is that it is surprising, it's striking how quickly the book gets into national concerns, global concerns, right? Um, um, the first Psalm seems to be very personal. <speaking in Hebrew> Happy is the man who does not walk in the, in the advice of the wicked, right? Okay, there are other people out there in the world, there's advice to take and not take, but it is a person's reflection. Um, as you'll soon see, Psalm 2 is already thinking about the nations. And that's, you know, we, we use the Psalms um, so often in, 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 in our tradition, probably primarily in our personal prayers, that we may not think of them as um, reflections on um, the state of affairs in the world, but we will soon see that the, the very second psalm, and, and many of them actually touch on these, um, on these sorts of themes. Um, the only other thing that I want to, 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 to say before we actually look at, at, the, at, the, at the verses themselves um, is to ask you um, to think a, a little bit about who wrote the psalms. So who wrote, who wrote the psalms? Anyone know? Anyone know? Let's see if I can see that. King David. King David, good. King David. That is the tradition, um, is that the Psalms were written by King David. And um, I'm going to give you a, a source sheet right now. We're going to see where that notion comes from. Um, now, the Psalms immediately, one must say, cannot have all been written by King David. Right? That's, that's not possible because... Um, Many of them uh, are, seem to be like explicitly written by other people or reflecting on um, times that are post King David. Oh, I'm not getting my, hold on a sec. Rabbi Kosher, isn't it thought that the King David wrote the first two books and others wrote the other three? So, uh, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look now at the, so I've, I've copied a, a source sheet um, into the chat for you. Somehow, uh, see, maybe you can turn that into an actual link. I always do that wrong. But um, yeah, there you go. Um, all right, so let's take a look. The actual, like who wrote what? Um, it's hard to say, we don't know, but take a look at um, the, the idea that King David wrote the Psalms is first articulated in the Talmud and even there, I just, I just think this is quite striking. Before we get into Psalms, let's just take a look at how the Talmud um, presents this notion that they are offered by King David. So who wrote the books of the Bible, the Talmud asks. Moses wrote his own book, meaning the Torah, and the portion of Balaam in the Torah, meaning there's a, there's a foreign prophet in the Torah, but Moses wrote that stuff as well, and the book of Job. And that's, now that's really interesting, the idea that, Moses wrote the book of Job. That's, we could spend an hour talking about that. But um, then they keep going. Joshua wrote his own book, meaning Joshua, and eight verses in the Torah. Why eight verses in the Torah? Because Moses' death is written in the Torah, and the Talmud wonders, well, how could Moses have written about his own death? That must have, must have been the last eight lines were by Joshua. Samuel wrote his own book, the book of Judges, uh, wrote his own book, Samuel, the book of Judges, and the book of Ruth. And then it says, David wrote the book of Psalms with the help of 10 elders, and he included Psalms authored by Adam, the first person, by Melchizedek, king of Shalem, of, of Salem, by Abraham, and by Moses, and by um, Haman, he -man, 
and by uh, Yedutan, and by us, and by Asaf, and by the three sons of Korah. So that all, like, that already, you're getting like, Moses wrote the Torah, and then even when they say that David wrote the Psalms, they're sort of saying, well, David wrote the Psalms, he had a lot of help, there are a lot of different people involved, he included other kinds of material. So even in the Talmud, they're saying David wrote the Psalms, but they're sort of saying, well, you know, not exactly. And, and I, I want us, I wanted, I wanted to show you that. I wanted to start with that notion because um, I think what it is more than anything is a very helpful device. It is, it is in, in many of the Psalms, there's a reason why they're saying this. And, and that is that in many of the Psalms, it is um, helpful to, to imagine someone like David, King David writing the Psalm because the Psalms seem to speak from the voice of, well, that's who they imagined it was. And I think you'll soon see why, but I, I, I say that to offer that device of imagining David um, composing the Psalms, but also to begin um, uh, directing us with a more general question um, that we ought to keep in mind whenever we're, we're reading the Psalms, which is, um, who's talking? Who's narrating? Who is the voice that is speaking in this psalm? And in this one in particular that we're going to look at tonight, um, that question I think is supremely important because one of the artistic poetic devices that, the, um, that this psalm is going to use is a kind of switching of narrative voice. Right? Like It actually um, will get confusing, or at least was for me at certain points, um, trying to figure out who exactly is talking. Okay, so let's let's without further ado take a look at this, and we're gonna kind of we're gonna go line by line. Um, I'm gonna read the whole thing and then return to the top, just so we have the poem in front of us, and then return to the top to take a look just line by line because there's a development of I don't think an idea, but in a development of a of a a development of a, of a, of a, of a, of a feeling as a, and it's, and it switches and moves throughout, throughout this song. So let's, let's take a look. Um, any other questions before we dive in? Okay. All right. So here we are, uh, Psalm two, right? Very, like not the very first, but really close there. And here's how it goes. Lama ragshu goyim, ulumim, ulumim yegu rik. Why are nations frenzied and countries dwelling on empty things? Yitiatzvu malche eretz, veroznim nozdu yachad, al Adonai val meshicho. Kings of the earth take their stand and ministers conspire together against God and against God's anointed. Ninatka et mosrotenmu, venashlicha mimenu, Avotemu, let us break the cords of their yoke, shake off their ropes from us. Yoshev Bashamayim Yishak, Adonai Yilag Lamo, the one who sits in heaven laughs, the Lord mocks them. Az Yidaber Eilemo Ba'apo, Uvacharono Yivalemo, then speaks to them in anger, terrifying them with rage. Vani Nasachti Malki Al Zion Harkadshi, but I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Asapra el Chokadonai, Amar elai bniata, ani hayom liditicha. Let me tell you of the decree of the Eternal, who said to me, You are my child, I have raised you this day. Sha'al mimeni ve'etna goyim nachlatecha, v'achuzatecha asfei aretz. Ask it of me, and I will make the nations your domain, your estate, the limits of the earth. You can smash them with an iron rod, shatter them like pottery. So now, kings, be reasonable. Discipline yourself, rulers of the earth. Ivdu et Adonai biyira v'gilu barada. Serve the Eternal in awe, rejoice in trembling. Nashku var penye anaf v'tovdu derech 
ki yivar ki matapo. Kiss purely, lest God spurn you and your path be doomed in the mere flash of God's anger. Ashrei kol chosevo. Happy are all who take refuge in God. Okay, I think you can already see lots of twists and turns along the way and not entirely uh, easy to follow, at least I didn't find it to be so. Um, but let's try and, I'm gonna ask you to resist um, jumping to the, um, to the end or to things you, you noticed just reading through, because I wanna try and take this one line at a time. And the first line is uh, a real doozy. It really uh, packs a punch. Um, so let's just spend some moments reflecting on the opening statement or sentiment of this psalm why are nations frenzied and countries dwelling on empty things? Now, that's a little bit, I took the translation, I mod I've modified it a little bit. I want to say one thing that I've modified here is the word um, here for frenzied in Hebrew is ragshu. And those of you who know a little Hebrew may know that this is related to the words that we use just for feeling or sentiment or strong emotion, regesh, hargasha. So I think um, it is translated variously um, as why, are, why do nations rage? Um, I think the translation I had was why do nations plot, but that doesn't make sense to me. There's some, the verb is some kind of, why do nations have this tremendous feeling, this, this burst of feeling, which I've translated as frenzied, and countries dwelling on empty things. So I want to turn it over to you to tell me what the heck that means. What is the concern here? And the last thing I'll say before I do is just to, to point out um, something that we mentioned last time, which is that the central, if there is a principal narrative or poetic device um, in biblical poetry, it is parallelism. We talked about that. And so you can see here how there, is, there are some uh, parallelism meaning um, saying one thing and then saying something very similar right after it as a way of both, you know, comparing and contrasting. So you can see some of the words here feel like synonyms and some of them uh, are very different. And both of those things are meant to be kind of sparked in us as we, as we consider uh, uh, the, the, ju the juxtaposition here. But okay, let me just start by asking you, what is going on here? What, what, is, what are some of the concerns here? Why are nations frenzied and, frenzied and countries dwelling on empty things? What does that mean? Why are, nation, well, are nations frenzied or raging or feeling a lot? And are nations dwelling on empty things? What, what is that kind of concern? All right, let's start with Rachel. Um. I don't know that this is an insight into the poem, but it immediately reminded me of Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot. Um, like the closing, and I just pulled it up very quickly, when he says, like when you see, those who don't know it, it's about looking at the earth from far away. And then at the closing, he said, there is perhaps no better demonstration than the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our ti tiny world. It underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with each other. And he also says in it, he's like, on that pale blue dot, that's everyone that's ever lived, think of all the wars that have been fought. So something about the beginning right there, when I think of the folly and the frenziness of nations, I just got, it kind of felt like the, the little things compared to like the cosmic time scale and our follies versus dwelling in the divine and being in each other's image and everything we share, yet the fightings and the things, um, like lately I've been thinking of the golden calf not as like an idol god, but of like just all the false idols we go about in our day. Um, like what are we valuing? Um, not that I'm not like doing that myself and like, stress shopping uh, after the election online but um yeah it just it, i just got this very quick image of like scale and kingdoms fall and kingdoms rise um that just reminded me of carl sagan okay good so that's there that's a good first pass like part of this is why do people why are people obsessed with the things that they are why do we care about well, why can't we see the big picture why are we why are we frenzied about things that um but okay 
it, that's the big, big picture, the globe. But again, it's nations, it's people. There's like countries, little meme, like national language here. What's the, what is the, what's the frenzy? And what is the, what's, and what's the empty? Gary? Can you put the, uh, yeah, put I'll put it right words back. back up. Yeah, yeah go right. for it. So I'm looking at the Hebrew. And it's interesting to me that it's goyim and then it's umim, okay? And it's not the same word for nations. Um, and, and I would also translate where you've translated as countries, I would say they're peoples. Um, and so it's talking about the country, but then it's talking about the human beings. And I think it's a question and it's a statement. Lama um, ragshu goyim, Okay, why are nations frenzied? But then the next thing is really a statement. Um, and it's like, it's almost making, it's not a question any longer. It's saying that their people um, are dwelling or behaving in empty things. And the fact that it ends on, if you're looking at poetry and it ends on the word reek, which is like, boom. Um, so it's making a really strong statement there um, about the emptiness of, of the people that they're dwelling on. Um, and so I'm not going to say any more because I think you don't want to get into the rest of it yet, but the rest of it starts to explain. Okay, good, good. So that's good. So Gary's doing some of that work, that parallelism work. Is, is, are there two kinds, and you're right, I translated as countries. I wasn't sure exactly how it, because peoples sometimes means you know, just people and sometimes na uh, like a nation of like the people of Israel. But maybe there is something different there in the, 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 the kinds of gatherings being discussed. And, um, and in, in, you know, and now that we've contrasted those things, um, let's also think about what is the difference between the frenzy and the empty? Because those actually feel like very different things, right? Like a, fren a frenzy of feeling is a lot, it's full. Right, and then and 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 Gary, you're so right that the to, from a from a kind of poetic perspective, just the sound of reek. That's a very unusual and strong emptiness. Okay, um, uh, Isra. Uh, yeah, two two thoughts I'd like to share. Um, I'm struck by um, looking at this from I guess like a psychological lens of states of how a a person could be, and then extract that to a national level. Um, like both kinds of states of being that are extremes. Um, sometimes they talk about like, you know, there's this one field of psychotherapy, there's like, you know, dialectical. So there's like the emotion mind, which can go to an extreme, the, the you know, the emotion dysregulation, too many rigashim, you know, too many emotions, um, you know, the parts take over. And then there's like getting into the, the other extreme of logic mind except like logic that gets to such an extreme that there's no longer any logic there. It becomes empty. It's almost like obsessive. So, um, I, you know, maybe that, like I, I can see that. What's interesting for me though, is coming out of this election, <laughs> um, I can't help but like be where I am in historically in our point in time and look at that and then wonder about the author at that point in time. It's, it's kind of like whoever's writing that is a little detached. I'm wondering like, is this meant to be, yes, timeless, but like whoever's like penning this, there's a detachment there. Like, oh, the goyim over there and the nations over there, but we, we're not, we're not the ones in the frenzy and the obsession, like the empty obsessiveness. So that's kind of interesting to me because I've been feeling a little pulled between the two or observing that too. So yeah, I'm kind of wondering like, what's the author? Who's the author here? Okay, good, good. As I said, that's going to be one of our central questions, and I'm going to ask it. I'm going to ask it again in a more emphatic way in a couple of verses. But it's already worth thinking about that. And the other thing that you did, Esther, which I want to invite people to continue to do, is I did. I I is to bring in what's on your mind. I mean, I I I did want to make sure that we could um, have a space where we don't have to talk about the election. But if it feels relevant, bring it in. I mean, that's uh, that's that's it's fair game as well. I'm going to take two more comments, Hannah and Yael, and then I'm going to move to, to um, further ver ver verses. Hannah? Yeah, you, you posed a question at some point about the, the kind of stark difference between overfeeling and emptiness or something, but I actually think they're the same. Um, I think that the initial expression is that people are so consumed by something 
and by all of these feelings in some way, but that those are maybe not the important things. And that the emptiness is not that there's a lack of feeling suddenly and that it's in contrast, but that maybe there's a lack of God or a lack of faith. And that the reality is that people are, and these nations are so consumed by things that aren't actually the point. Like people are losing the forest to the trees and they're drowning in all of these real feelings, but they're also losing the point of what's at stake or what's happening. And so the emptiness is exactly the experience of being in that space, not a separate one. Okay, okay, beautiful. I see Yael nodding. So Yael, you wanna build Yeah, I, I agree with Hannah. Um, to me, I would, I, tr I would translate it as, instead of, um, I would translate it as upset. And I would say, wh why are these people up so upset, living in an upset way, running after emptiness? And it, it's consistent with the second stanza too, that people are, not only people, but peoples, individuals and communities are running in the wrong direction. And God is sitting and smiling, waiting for you to turn your head and look up. But we're all running, you know, like these hamsters on this flaming wheel and getting all in a turmoil about it when it's here all the time. You're muted. We can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, yeah Elle can't resist taking us forward a little bit. So, um, so let's move forward. Um, uh, let's take a look because the opening statement is one that is very, very broad, right? Like the nations and they they are um they are upset or they are raging or they are frenzied or they are and, and they are dwelling on empty things but it, there's something very vague about it and then suddenly it gets very specific um take a look at the next line here why are nations frenzies and countries dwelling on empty things kings of the earth take their stand and ministers conspire together against god and against god's anointed now that's a big thing against God, Adonai, the Al Mishicho, God's anointed. Now, this word here, this is an important word, right? Uh, those of you who read Hebrew know that this is the word that we use for what great theological concept? Mashiach, Mashiach, the, the Messiah, Mashiach, the Mish, Mishicho. But in our tradition, the Messiah is not a demigod. In our tradition, the Messiah is literally uh, one who is, who is Mashuach, is someone who's been anointed. And they used to have this ceremony for picking new leaders where they would like douse their, their, uh, their foreheads in oil, like to anoint them, right? So um, here, well, I don't know. I, I guess I want, let, let me just stop here. What's happening? Who's, what, what's the problem? These, the, all these nations that were so, um, they were so enraged or they were so obsessed with emptiness. And what they're, what's actually going on is they are conspiring against God and God's anointed one. Whoa, that's quite a story. Where, what, what's, what's going on here? Emil? Against me. I mean, right? Like, this is like, like, who are these Goyim running around making trouble for me? Like, I don't, I know this is like a great poem, but it just seems like someone sitting in Bel Air being like, why all these, what's all this fuss? Like, why are people running around? I also have problems, you know? Like, it's just, I, there's something impressive about it, but it's also this obliviousness. Like, it's depending on, I get you, but, but like, yeah, like, like, like David's got this God's eye view and there are all these like silly people making trouble. And uh, you know, why, why would they do such a thing? I don't understand. Okay, okay, beautiful. Uh, Emil, Emil helps us out a lot because um, here's where you can start to see the idea of King David as the author of this, of this, of the Psalms, right? It seems that the voice is the person who is, why are they, why are they reeling against God and God's anointed? That could be an observer, but as Emil imagines it, it's like, I'm the anointed one. Like, why are the, all of these nations are all up in arms, but I was chosen by God. They're, they, okay, we can continue to, to build this out, but just to give us a sense of what, how that connection is made textually, I wanna show you one other thing and then open it up for further comments. This word, right, that, that the Mashiach, the anointed one, 
we actually do see that word used um, for King David, for many of the kings. Um, but um, one of the, Rashi uh, brings us to this verse here in Samuel that says that when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, the Philistines marched up in search of David. But David heard of it and he went down to the fastness. So there you go. David is, some, is sometimes referred to as the anointed one. So now you can really begin to imagine what Emil is imagining, that David is the one saying, look at all these nations. Like, why are they blank? And why are they conspiring against me? <laughs> okay, so that's how Emil was reading it. Anybody reading it differently or want to add to that? I see Jamie's got a hand up. And can we see you, Jamie? Uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see what it's shape I'm in there here. There we go. Hi. <laughs> um, what do I want to say here? Uh, oh, it seems like the author is saying something along the lines of there is too much separation between church and state. That's what, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. What, that's what's creating chaos in countries, in communities, is that they don't have the proper godly leadership. Um, you know, that kings don't serve purposes higher than themselves. They presumably serve themselves or whatever it is. And so then the people are all out of sorts because they don't have holy leaders. They don't have centered, grounded leaders. They have self-interested leaders maybe. And so then the people are like, let's get rid of these kings. Um, okay, great. That's, that's that's very helpful. And, and Hannah touched on this a little bit before too. It does seem we're soon gonna find that the great obsession of this speaker is God and God's truth and God's way. And there, like, I, I wanna open that, that sort of rhetoric up to both um, the kind of, a kind of like zealous fundamentalist kind of uh, overtone uh, maybe this will strike you as as a, as as a little um, hard a little hard driving here, like a little a little overkill on the you know God's way and God's law. But I also want to invite us to think about what God represents here. Like, what does it mean for this speaker to be thinking that that there's a kind of leadership that is divinely appointed or directed or wrap or 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 um, or wrapped up in God's will, and then there's some other kind of leadership out there that's not attentive to that. Okay. Um, other thoughts here before we move forward? Okay. All right, so let's take a look now. And um, we have, with Emil's help, imagined that so far David has been talking, but now um, we're gonna get a, a, a kind of, I put it in quotes here, because it seems to be a different speaker. Let us break the cords of their yoke. Shake off their ropes from us. Now, who is that? Who's saying that? I don't have a sense of who that is. The crazy Goyim Amim? Yeah, the, okay, that's one read, is that, the, that the, the composer of this psalm is now quoting what they imagine these other nations to be said. Let's, we don't care about God. We don't care about God's anointed one. Let's let's break off the we'll break off the what the 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 cords the 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 bonds the um, the ropes. This but is even but even, even though it's a different voice, it's the same poetic rhythm, which I find very interesting. So it's not like someone else wrote this. Then the other it's it's the same rhythmic movement. Um, in the same way that the lines all sound very much the, like the same author. Good, good, right. The form holds throughout the poem. So what you have and what we're gonna be investigating is you have a narrator, but a narrator who is like playing a lot of different parts. Right? You can hear one voice consistent throughout. It's clearly one person fashioning this whole narrative, but it's one voice who's like, change it, you can imagine him doing voices almost. Oh, like, let's break off these chords, right? Like these, these, these despicable nations, right? And 
Um, and then we're going to we're going to have a switch again. Anyone want to speak to the cords? What are the cords or the ropes? All these things, these nations that are so willing to defy God. What are these bonds, cords, ropes? That language. Anyone want to have a take on that? Uh, how? Well, I mean, they're the you know the constraints of tyranny or uh, unjust rule. I mean, these are people essentially. Uh, rebelling or acting out against uh, oppressive leaders. Okay, that sounds right to me, but it seems that if we're follow unless someone's got a different sense of who who is speaking this verse, it seems then that the the oppressive rule is God's rule, is the anointed one's rule, is David's rule, right? So it's like sort of like mocking this these people who don't want to be constrained, but describing. God's dominion as a constraint. Man, like, what, what do we do with that? I think I saw Sura had a hand up. Yeah, I, I think that that this is the, the, the ministers and the rulers of the bad guys who are saying this because David wants to make everybody follow the rule of God and these other people are not interested in that. So rather than so that they would then want to persuade them not to follow the rule of God, throw off your yoke and get to be like all the rest of us. Okay. That's more how I see it. Okay. This, this, this narrator who it, we've already said is sort of obsessed with God and following God's will is like, I mean, this, this is a real fundamentalist. Like it's an outrage with these people who are unwilling to submit to the rule of God. There's like this person who's right. Who is raging? The Taliban. The What's Taliban. The Taliban. The Taliban. The Taliban. I don't want to overstate it, but but <laughs> but but it's interesting, right? Like the the narrator calls out these other nations for feeling too much, for raging too much. But who is actually in the midst of of Sturm und Drang here? Right? Okay, Florian, you want to pick up on this? I have a different take. <laughs> Please. I think. Uh... David is raging against his enemies, which he does a lot in his Psalms. And I think he's raging against the enemies within himself that are wrestling with God because he was no angel. <laughs> Good. So I, I don't see other people. I think it's all aspects of David. Okay, good. That, that's, that'll be very helpful moving forward because we're going to continue to get very dramatic narration. But remember, it's all emerging from one mind, right? So what is the state of this person? And I think that's a good question to ask with Psalms in general, because Psalms are just these sort of like emotive bursts. Yeah. And, and, and we have to, and, and as I said, they're not always, and sometimes they're very inspiring. And sometimes you're a little repelled by the emotion you're getting. So what is the state of mind of, well, let's, let's call him David, but like of this, of this narrator, let's move a little bit forward. Or we're sort of starting to creep towards um, the, uh, the last third of the hour here. So uh, let's read a few verses and get yet another kind of twist in the story, right? So we've got the, um, the, the critique of nations and a, the specific critique that may be spoken by the very, <laughs> the very subject here, like the God's anointed. And then I think we've agreed an imagining of these nations wanting to break loose in their sort of their godlessness. Okay, here's one of the great lines I think in all of scripture. Yoshev b'shamayim yitzchak, the one who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord mocks them. I mean, I just, I don't know if that's a cool version of vision of God, but I do like the idea of God laughing. Uh, Gott lacht, right? As, as they say in the Yiddish. Okay, but let's just read what God said. And then there's a twist. God, the one who sits in heaven laughs, the Lord mocks him, then speaks to them in anger, terrifying them with rage. But I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. All right, let's, let's stop there. So what's God like? in this narrator's um, uh, uh, expression. What is, what's God thinking or up to or laughing, raging? What, what's God's concern here? 
well, what's God laughing about? It's not funny, <laughs> you know? Um. <laughs> Florian, you want to go again? Yeah. I, don't have any takers. I think he, he's saying, get your act together. <laughs> Good, okay, <laughs> for sure. You're really going to have to get your act together because take a look now at, uh, at what God um, God says, God says, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Now remember, we're imagining that it is the king who is, who is composing a poem about how God is upset that you're not recognizing God's king. Right? But God isn't saying this. It's the king who's saying it. Right? And then he says more, and this is really, I mean, like, talk about fundamentalism. This is really harsh stuff. Let me tell you, says the narrator, of the decree of the eternal, who said to me, you are my child. I have raised you on this day. Ask it of me and I will make the nations your domain. Exactly. Your estate, the limits of the earth. And then this really harsh, you can smash them with an iron rod, shatter them like pottery. Okay, what's going on here, right? Like again, this figure is saying, you better watch out because I will tell you what God said to me. God said, I can destroy you all. That's what God said to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what are you, like, what's the response? Like, who, what state of mind is this person in? Is it, is it a, is it a reasonable state? Of, is it a rational state of mind? Is it like, do you trust this person's faith? All right. Um, let's, uh, let's circle back around here. Who's, anyone not spoken? Noah. Yeah, I, I have found the whole thing very off-putting. Um, <laughs> the image of uh, God letting this sort of angry uh, speaker give, give this person the option to essentially rule the world, to shatter kings and kingdoms like pottery with an iron rod, you know, with a, a strength that is no match for... Uh, the people who conspire against God does not make it makes me uneasy. And what's hard, and this is my problem, this is this, my struggle with a lot of like biblical poetry and psalms sometimes, is I can't tell whether the poem wants me to be excited or uh, uncomfortable because I feel uncomfortable. I, I don't like this image of the speaker, I don't like this image of God. Great. Let's take Noah's question. Does the poem want us to sympathize with all this rage or to be a little, as Noah is, but put, put off by it? What, what do you think? What's the, what's the, what sentiment? Are we, are, we, are we on board here or is this meant to repel? Uh, I saw some hands. I saw Carol, Carol, do you have a hand up? Yeah, I, I think it, from the beginning I thought, and I'm thinking it more as it goes through, that he's talking about his, whole, his son anointed. He doesn't want any of the younger brothers to, um, or the other tribes or anybody to interfere with his plan. Well, this is if David's speaking or whoever it is speaking, that he's, he's the Lord, he, I am the Lord's anointed. So you better all get out of my way. And I've got the God behind me and he's gonna smash you if you don't obey. Okay, that's great. Imagine David who was in fact assailed throughout his life with external rivals, right, the nations, but- And also no real father. Right, also internal real rivals, father. right? The real, real, like, real civil war, real, and not just internal in his country, but internal his own sons, right? Like, he had a vision for who would inherit, and another son wanted to inherit, and his whole, his whole family became a civil war, right? So, and if you read the book of Samuel, you would see David, oh, so stressed out, and and, dis and, and doesn't know what to do and is heartbroken. And, but in the Psalm, it's a very different David. It's as if like, there's a part of him that's just like, listen to me, I'm the king. I get to do what I want. Like, that's a, all right. It's a, like, it's a, like a David in, 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 the, in the therapist's office, right? A different, a different uh, voice that, than we usually hear from him. Okay, uh, let's see, Alexandra, I think I saw you had a hand up also. Um, so I don't know if this is a fair comment because I'm looking at it from sort of a different angle because uh, it is sort of disturbing to me looking at it from a poetry angle and I don't love 
do all of this anger, but I have a list from uh, that the ancient Babylonian Jews and like how they used each of the Psalms mystically. And so looking at it like practically, it makes a lot of sense because Psalm number two is actually applicable now. It's for storms in the ocean. So for hurricane season, um, this is what what uh, this, the Psalm to read according to the ancient Babylonian Jews and their mystical uses of the Psalms. Uh, so that brings me comfort to look at it from that angle, like what are the mystical purposes and uses of these Psalms? Good. I mean, you, like Noah, are dealing with some discomfort that you feel. And I, I want to just, I want to just, um, just welcome everybody to feel discomfort. I, I think that we are often, as Noah alluded to, troubled by the, the sentiment that we see, it, the values maybe even that we see expressed by biblical text. But first of all, sometimes they are just not our values and we're like, we're in conflict because we're kind of trying to reconcile our, our kind of our place in history with these ancient texts. But I, I think on a, like even more importantly that these texts are, as I said at the outset, often wanting to disturb us, wanting to rattle us, wanting to undermine these characters that we revere, wanting to really problematize their emotions. And David is a complicated, complicated figure who has both incredibly um, radiant aspects, uh, uh, incredibly attractive aspects of his personality as we read it in the book of Samuel and is also a monster in all kinds of ways. Right? So like, I, I welcome both of those, both of those, uh, both of those encounters with David. Um, I want to, since we're down to the last 10 minutes here, I want to take the, the sort of final, well, I feel like every line in this poem is a new twist, but you can see how there have been movements. And I want to take us into the last movement, right? We started with um, this sort of general reflection on the state of the world and a frustration with the state of the world. And then it becomes personal because they're, they're confronting God and God's anointed. And maybe this is God's anointed speaking, right? And then um, mocking them in all kinds of ways, imagining that they don't want to be faithful to God's will and that God is, God, God mocks them. And God laughs at them and then God threatens them. But it's all God threatening them through the imagination of this, of this narrator who is potentially this king, right? And it gets really vicious, really severe. It ends with this incredibly, you can smash them with an iron rod, shatter them like pottery, okay? And then finally, like, there's a, almost as if the speaker quiets down and says, so, O kings, atamalachim, askilu, be reasonable. Think about this. Discipline yourself, rulers of the earth. Serve the eternal in awe. Rejoice in trembling. This is one of the great phrases I think in, in the Psalms, gilu barada, right? Which means rejoice in trembling. And I, I don't know exactly how to fit that in. That's just a remarkable phrase. So be, be reasonable, discipline yourself, serve the eternal in awe, rejoice in trembling. And then this last line, which is just, I have translated it much more literally than I have seen in any translation, but I just feel like I, I have to, I have to reveal what is in these words. Kiss purely. That is, that's the words, nashku var. And it's often translated as like, you know, on, offer tribute with, pure, with a pure heart or um, um, desire God with, a pure, with purity. But the word here is kiss, or at least the word we use for kiss. It, means, it is at least meant to have that, that illusion. And lest God spurn you, the word there is the same word, oops, the same word that we use for, anyone recognize this? Ya'enaf. Same word that we use for adultery. So kiss God pure in a pure way, or else God will leave you behind, like abandon you and, and find a new match, right? And your path be doomed in the mere flash of God's anger. And then finally, like as if it, this seems almost disconnected, happier are all those who take refuge in God. So, like, what just happened? What's going on at the like? nations, you rage and you don't want any boundaries and you don't want any cords or ropes. Well, you're going to have to serve God and God's angry and God's told me that I can destroy you. And so, so now, like, be reasonable. Like, discipline yourselves and serve God and be happy and 
be humble and ever, those who who uh, who seek refuge in God are like what's just what just happened at the end there what is David what is David saying there at the end okay um, let's start with Gary so I want to say a couple things first I think this poet is is exceedingly visual and very dramatic um, and it's a writer because everything from he laughs and then he gets angry. It's like a typical playwright. It's like this person is writing a play with all these visual ideas that are going, so you're actually seeing it. And even, Rabbi, I would, um, Nashkuvar, uh -huh. would be translated as kiss wildly. Um, uh -huh. And so you get this other sense that's going on there and so the person is writing in, in, in a very typical, like almost like playwright fashion, it reaches peaks, but you can't keep your audience like this constantly. Then you gotta take them down calmly. And so I see this whole rhythmic thing going on. And I think in the end, personally, I don't believe it. I just think this is a writer having a hell of a time. What don't you believe? What don't you believe? I don't believe the message that's in here, I think it's more it's more a writer's um, medium that we're looking at here than a message medium. Great, great. Okay, that's that. I, I I'll, I'll take take Gary's reflection as as another question for the group. Is are we meant to learn a lesson here, or have we just seen a leader or a narrator like in kind of emotional? upheaval and crisis just spewing different ideas and just sort of like feeling or raging his way through a kind of chaotic soliloquy here. What, what, what exactly is going on? Um, Michal. So I, I want to offer a completely different read of this um, because I, I, the character that really this reminds me most of is the great zealot of the Tanakh, which is Ezra. Mm. And Ezra is a purely political guy, right? The politics are theocratic, but it's a politics of inhabiting the land and taking over and um, kicking out the people who aren't there, who are already there. And um, and he he he's not he doesn't embody our values particularly. But if you look at this poem right from the start, it starts with the nations, with the peoples, with the kings of the earth. And if you read the whole thing from the, that sort of a political angle, it really all holds together. Because what it's saying is there is a, an order that is supposed to be in place. That order is my theocratic order and everything else really has to has to be shattered, has to be broken like the pottery with the iron rod. So to me, this holds together. It's it is poetic in that it uses all the the traditions of po of biblical poetry. It uses the language and the rhythms and the parallelism. I would even say that some of these, where they're broken up into different verses, are actually single verses, and that the parallelism is working on two levels. Mm -hmm. But um, but it, once you start thinking about it, it starts with the nation. So if you stay with the idea of the nations, it really all makes sense to me. Great, I, I love that analysis. And, I, and, and what I especially appreciate ab about it is that um, I think um, Mi Michal is, um, is, is extracting a kind of a vision or a cohesive message. And we may not li like what you use the word Michal, a order that this person, is looking at a, at a world in disorder. And this person wants to see a certain order and we may be a little bit like put off by the imposition of divine rule and that might be not be the order that, that we would wish for our society. Uh, it might seem a little too intense, the, the theocratic order, but it is, we can, I, I just, what I like about that analysis is that it has some recognition that the speaker is trying to say something like, this world is in ruins. What is going on here? We need some kind of, and, and God is, is the ultimate good in this person's, in this person's uh, I, vision for the world. So can't we just have 
a, a, a divine rule? Can't we have a divine order in the world? Things are such a mess, right? So, uh, so I think, yeah, that's a very, very, I appreciate that reading, a very strong, cohesive reading. I think we have time for one more comment. I'll take Janet. Hi, thanks. Uh, I was just looking at how the juxtaposition and it can be good and bad and we can, we can smash pottery and kiss purely and ha it's like the, the chaos of life. And it's kind of like the chaos we're going through now, but we can have our beautiful car community and we can have crazy chaos going on in the world. And, and so I just want you to know how much I appreciate you picking this poem tonight. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks so much. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I want um, to turn back for one, for our last two minutes to this phrase, which, um, which Gary uh, re-emphasized and, re and I emphasized to begin with, because it really is a startling phrase. And I just saw Dev Grouse um, also spoke about it in the chat. This last phrase here, um, um, kiss purely or desire purely, or as um, Gary and Dev are suggesting, um, wildly, kiss wildly desire wildly, lest God, you know, cheat on you, lest God leave you behind, right? Now, I think we really have, that is such a wild phrase to introduce at the end of this sort of like, you know, angry, like rumination on the state of the world, that I, I think we really have to think about that, that, that intimate language. And let's remember that David as a leader um, was complicated and charismatic and, and terrible in all kinds of ways. But one thing that David was known for was his intense passion and passion for God and love of God. In fact, David's name means beloved, which is not a coincidence. David was God's beloved. And there is this way in which David must be talking about if this, you know, if we imagine this as David, right, which the rabbis did, then it, 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 David must be talking about himself. Kiss God the way I kiss God. Be intimate, God, the, with the, with the way I am. Or else God will spurn you. Right? There's a danger there that if you're not in close enough relationship with God, that God will cast you aside. And as David is reflecting on, on his own relationship with God, I think David must also, and Florine was pointing us here earlier, David must also be thinking, or the, the leader here must be thinking, that, that, that they too are in danger. Right? Like they too are summoning all this fervor for God because if you don't give God all of that, all of that passion, you'll be cast aside too. Right? And so, in a way, I think one way to read this poem is that David is raging out against all of these other leaders who are not faithful enough to God, but also talking to himself and also worried that maybe, maybe he isn't he isn't devoted enough to God, that he isn't. Um, the, so that when he ends by saying happy is the one who, um, who takes a refuge in God, that, that that is a message to, that that last line there almost seems like suddenly you, you have the figure sort of talking to himself. Like, uh, you know, this is, this, is the, this is the path that I have, that I have learned, that I have tried to practice. And, I, and it's not a stable path. Right? The, the, the author here, too, needs to be worried about being doomed in a, mere, in a mere flash with God's anger. It's turbulent. It's a turbulent relationship that, that this leader is in. And I think the turbulence of the relationship with God is somehow like, you know, it's spoken of as if it were so simple. Just, just follow God's will. Just do what God says. But actually, that, too, is, is chaotic. Right? And you never quite escape the... The, the chaos of, of, the, of the state of things. So um, that is a little introduction to the Psalms and to the, the nationalistic um, element that, that courses um, throughout the Psalms. So um, I think we will uh, we'll leave it there tonight. I'll stay on for, uh, for another five or 10 minutes just to hear people's thoughts and comments. Um, but thank you, everybody. Uh, let's thank start you, with, Pastor. yeah. Um, let's start with, uh, I see Kathy out there. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, that was helpful at the end in terms of the turbulent relationship with God and the, yeah, it's very well passionate, this whole kissing thing, thing you know, wildly or whatever. But um, 
and finally, it kind of made sense of that God who laughs and mocks and then just immediately turns to rage. It is like this incredibly volatile, like per very personal relationship because that didn't I, I didn't quite get those lines, but it really does fit with the end, it seems to me. Um, uh, but in a really kind of scary way. I yeah. mean, kind of, you know, the, this, these sort of passionate lovers who are like, you know, going from laughter to rage to, you know, why, I, any- So, so, so well, well said, Kathy, better than I said it, which is that, that now look back at the poem and see this is a person who on the one hand is worshiping this God, but also sees this God as someone who can turn on you and just like a flicker of an instant and, and will be laughing and then suddenly, I mean, this is a God out of control. So like, you know, like serve this God, but you know, serve this God, rejoice with trembling, right? Like rejoice, but with trembling, you should always be a little bit nervous about this, right? Okay, it's complicated. Uh, Rachel. Um, I think this one in August, we were up talking about Moses and reading one of his things as a soliloquy. Now, when I sort of think of one speaker, I try to think of it like that way. And I agree with, like, to me, it does sound like he's arguing with himself. And especially like knowing that he is this flawed character. He's a flawed character who's also told he's anointed by God. Like that's gotta be a, I can't like my, that's, I don't know. I just imagine this being like, there's these peaks and valleys and the beginning to me is so beautiful. And then in the middle, it's so angry. And I just feel like he's wrestling with himself and he's projecting at times, like what, like what he is criticizing in others. I find that he's potentially fearing it in himself. Yeah. And it, it felt very Shakespearean to me. And it is kind of funny because then in the middle and he's like, and God is laughing. I mean, gosh, I feel like I don't know. I that feels so human to me to be like, what is this joke here? Like, God, are you laughing at me? Like David sitting there being like, yeah, okay, well, this is hilarious because this is a mess. So I just found it to be like this really like a a monologue of him wrestling with himself. And when I think about the mystical idea of saying this when you're on a ship, I mean the sea can like turn on you in an instant. Mm. Um and like that is a very, like, it can be beautiful and it can be powerful and there's no rhyme or reason, uh, you know, besides the weather patterns for like a sudden violence. Okay, great. I love the, I wanna say, I really appreciate the, the adjective Shakespearean because uh, there is, that, that, that is part of what I've been trying to um, push here, um, here and there all along, which is that, you know, when we read, when we read King Lear, we're not, like we don't necessarily admire the king, and yet yeah. this is an incredible literary portrayal. And I think it's the same thing with with right. biblical literature a lot. That it was sometimes we, this is our sacred scriptures, and these are our like our holy ancestors. So we're sometimes just um, disturbed by the fact that they can be such um, um, uh, uh, kind of we see such ugly sides to, to them. But I think that the, the Bible, like Shakespeare, was interested in presenting people and leaders in the fullness of their humanity with all of the, with all of the ugly, ugliness that that can include. And that, that's part of what's powerful, actually, about this literature. Um, OK, a couple more comments. Uh, Emil? Um, yeah, since, you know, obviously, it, it does feel like a monologue. And I was wondering, is there any chance that it was written to be like yelled on a mountaintop, like it sounds? Like, is there any chance that this would have been addressed to a crowd? The other thing, I mean, the thing that does give me the giggles is like, Lear, you have like three hours before you get to a speech like this. And this is like page two, day, boot, you know, but um, I guess in biblical times, life was short. So you had to get to the, but like, I, but yeah, but my question is like, was this written to be performed? Like, like some Psalms are, is there any chance that it would have been like a kind of um, Henry the, well, I'm going to say one traditional thing, and then, I, you know, there are other people, Michal, for example, who, who might be able to give us a, a little bit more historical perspective, but um, I will just say that the, the traditional notion is that these psalms were the kinds of, the, 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 the context was that they would be recited in the temple by the Levites. These are some of the 
the, the poems that they would recite as a as part of the service, which is a really interesting context to imagine. It's so like, like, beautiful like poetry, old, but, but really national, like really in the service of a national event. I don't know. Uh, all all gonna, of them? Because there's... Sorry. Not all of them. No, okay. not all of them. Okay. Because there this are some that say that, right? One, and then there, there are some... Well, there are, there are hints within the Psalms themselves as to which would be sort of sung in liturgical or ritual settings. This one doesn't really have those. All right. Um, no so, lamnaseach here. Right. There's that. I mean, there are all sorts of different invocations, um, but it definitely has all the hall hallmarks of national of a national literature. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and those existed. I mean, that existed back then. So mm -hmm. not necessarily in the time of David, but, you know, when this was being compiled. Mm -hmm. The idea of a national literature certainly existed. Yeah. Emil, you want to follow up on that at all? Um, oh yeah, I was going to say also, I, I do think, you know, I like I struggle with this, you know, but I do, I think that like a lot of the things we find disturbing about it are probably things that the downtrodden would have found appealing, like smash my enemies, mm. you know, like God create order here. And like, I was just thinking about that, like, like the things that you know, that kind of we all find like really um, unsettling, you know, a sort of tied to the power that this has probably had for other people um, who preceded us. Oh. Yeah, and you know, um, I, I want to say also, um, sort of echoing that, that there, that I myself um, resonate to some of the sentiments and like at least the opening line. Right? And, and sometimes with the Psalms or with poetry in general, it's like that. There's like, there's a phrase or a line that actually really uh, opens you up, even if the rest is not, not speaking to you. And I do feel that that, whatever else that, you know, the, in that sort of the, 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 the storm and, 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 um, and rage of this, of this narration, that first line just really stays with me. You know, that the nations are frenzied and the country's dwelling on empty things. And I, I, gosh, I feel that frenzy. And I also feel the emptiness. I feel like so much of our national or um, political culture is just filled with like meaninglessness and, and, yet, and yet just so much, um, so much feeling, so much rage, so much passion um, that seems to go nowhere. And, you know, I'm not, a, a, I'm not God's anointed one, so I, I have nothing really you know, no, nothing really so bold to respond to it, but I do, re I do resonate to that, that sentiment that there's just like, what's going on? We're, we're, we're saying so much and yet nothing at all. What's going on in the world, you know? So, uh, so maybe I'll, 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 I'll leave it on that note. Um, thanks for joining me tonight. I know it's a hectic time and I hope, uh, I hope this conversation has been useful, not in a direct way, but in a way that will just, linger in our minds and perhaps, who knows, inform some of the ways that we see things unfold in the, in the coming weeks and months. May, may they unfold um, for the good. Okay, good night, everyone. Thank you.